Um, hello everyone, my name is Manuel Li and I come from Chiang Mai University and uh, um, I'm glad to be here to introduce my uh, research paper to you. My title is The Impact of Environmental Related Technology Innovation on Green Growth in China, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia and the Philippines. And the first I will introduce my motivation, why I choose the green growth and why I say it is essential. And the world still have many development and the environmental issues need to solve. For example, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals aim to solving poverty and protect the earth and the rising living standards the UNEP also points to such emergencies as climate change and biodiversity loss and the need for a change in green growth as outlined by the OECD. The green growth strategy is a good and new growth model that pursues economic development while considering environmental protection, resource limitation, and biodiversity. Um, moreover, technology, innovation, and the human capital are the most likely to help achieve green growth and the sustainable future. Therefore, this paper selected ENT, uh, ETI, which is Environment Related Technology Innovation, as this study's object to explore its impact on green growth. Next, I will introduce my purpose of this study, there are three purposes. The first one is calculate the green growth index for China, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And the second is analyze of the impact of environmental related technology innovation green growth. And the last one is investigate the factors that impact on green growth. Um, this paper mainly contains two parts. The first part is to build a green growth index system and calculate it. And we selected 12 indicators from three dimensions. The first one is environmental and resource productivity. Second dimension is the environmental dimension of quality of life. And the last dimension is social economic context. And the second part is analyze the impact of ETI on green growth and the other factors affecting green growth. This paper also selects seven control variables. They are industry structure upgrading, urbanization level, innovation technology level, FDI dependence, export of goods and service, and human capital. Mm, about our Data is panel data. It's yearly from 1990 to 2012, 2021 in China, Japan, and Malaysia, South Korea, and the Philippines. And the source of data comes from OECD statistic and World Bank Open Data. And the next day, we, next one, I will introduce my research methodology. Mm. The first is the first methodology in this paper is to calculate the green growth index using entropy with topaces. And then we test for this series cross section dependence, slope heterogeneity. And uh, we also test the stationary of this data. Next. We do a co-integration test by using Johansson Fisher type panel co-integration. And the next step, we do benchmark regulation by using panel list square test. After the uh, regulation, we also check the robustness and the heterogeneous. And uh, next, I will introduce my results. Mm, from the right figure, we could see the green girls index trend over all the green girls index of five countries 
show an upgrade up upward trend and Japan, South Korea performed better than other three countries. China's green growth index is lowest, but the growth trend is dramatically. Mm. For the table 4.4 and 4.5 result, we can see that the variables have cross-section dependence and the slope heterogeneity problem. The result show in table 4.6 we can see that all variables are stationary at a level, except of industry structure and export of goods and service, which are stationary on first difference. And uh, we do the co-integration test. The results show um, rejected the non hypothesis which indicating that at least seven co-integration relations exist for the above variable. This also means long-term equilibrium is existing. And due to the panel data has heterogeneity problem, so the poor model is not suitable. After comparing fixed and random effects model, the cross-section fixed effect model is chosen in this study. The panel OLS regression results show that in model one, we could see the change of industry structure upgrading and the FDA dependence cannot pass a significant test. After eliminating those two variables, we get the model three and all variables can pass a significant test and the ETI, which is environmental related technology innovation is positively impact on green growth. Next, uh, the paper used the four, four modified list squares and the panel dynamic list squares called integrating regression method to test the robustness of the benchmark regression result. The result also, also show that coefficient of the core explanatory variable ETI is consistent with the above regression results. As such, the previous empirical results are robust. What's more, we do a heterogeneous test by separating two OLS regression of each country. The results show that except China can cannot pass a significant test. The other four countries' ETI can significantly impact green growth, which means the previous benchmark regression model is relatively valid and can pass a heterogeneous test. Finally, we get the um, conclusion. The core independent variable, environmental related technology innovation, are uh, positively and significantly impact on green goals. For the five, seven control variables, innovation, export of goods and service, human capital are positively impact on green goals. However, the technology development and the urbanization level is, is negatively impact green goals. And the foreign direct investment dependency and the uh, industry structure upgrading is insignificant impact on green growth. Based on this study results, the also suggested that the government should encourage to develop uh, um, environmental related technology innovation, which is beneficial to improve countries green growth. This is my reference. Thank you for your Good afternoon, everyone. Today, my topic is impact and mechanism of government information disclosure on companies' earnings management based on the perspective of government enterprise interaction. I'm honored to discuss two vital issues that play a significant role in our society, government information disclosure and corporate earnings management. I will discuss explore how these two elements interact and propose strategies to address earnings management 
challenge while promoting constructive cooperation between the government and the businesses, driving social progress and achieving mature success. Government information disclose is a product of societal progress, representing transparency in government operations and providing high quality service. It enables stakeholders to gain comprehensive insight into each other process and assets, fostering effective collaboration while anticipating potential issues that may hinder cooperation. However, this disclosure also poses challenge for enterprise earnings management, which I will discuss along with strategies to navigate this challenge effectively. Corporate earnings management is a fundamental aspect of financial management involving strategic manipulation and adjustment of financial statement to achieve financial objective legally and complementarily. It not only impacts the company's financial statements, but also influences business decisions and market reputation. To ensure sustainable growth, enterprises must exercise earnings management with legality and compliance. Government information disclosure positively affects corporate earnings management in several ways. Firstly, it reinforces corporate social responsibility as society increasingly prioritizes ethical business practice. By disclosing information, enterprises better understand public expectations, enhancing their ability to fulfill their social responsibilities effectively. This positively impacts earnings management by promoting a responsible approach to business. Secondly, government information disclosure can bolster corporate compliance. By disseminating laws, regulations, and policies, enterprises better understanding their legal obligations. This empowers them to avoid unlawful conduct and adhere to government policies, ultimately boosting compliance. Additionally, improved internal management and regulation help companies maintain ethical practice and increase compliance. Moreover, government information disclosure can impact enterprise business models by fostering market transparency. This encourages competition and incentives business to improve product quality, innovate technologically, and reduce cost, ultimately contributing to market share and profitability growth. Emphasizing social responsibility, enterprises actively participate in public welfare. Incentive for fortifying corporate image and reputation. Furthermore, government information disclosure can promote legal tax payments. By unveiling entrepreneurial tax information, the public can accept their tax status, instilling a sense of duty in businesses to comply with tax laws and avoid evasion. Incentives for tax compliance can further motivate enterprises by to pay tax delicately, disseminating Knowledge of tax laws and providing taxation training also enhance enterprise understanding and adheres to tax regulations. Despite this benefit, government information disclose face challenge. One challenge involved the advertent disclosure of commercially confident information by, by government department, leading to the economic losses and reputation damage for affected enterprise, misconduct within enterprise, such as leaking confidential information for personal gain, may also occur due to information disclosure. Policy transparency is another issue, as the government information sharing and the coordination may be lacking. Defining the standard and scope of government information disclosure may require refinement to prevent vital policy details from being classified as secret, hindering transparency. To promote government information disclosure with ensuring effective enterprise earnings management, several policy recommendations should be considered. Firstly, scrutinizing the timing of relevant tra transactions must be strengthened. Through so audit and verification during financial statement preparation will ensure transparency in transactions between enterprise and the relative parties. Secondly, accounting policy related to 
current asset impairment in provision should be strengthened. Limit, limiting the provision for impairment of current asset will prevent financially troubled companies from manipulating their earnings. Strength internal management and external supervision will ensure the occurrence of asset impairment provisions. Lastly, the audit and evaluation of government funding should be fortified by ensuring effective use of subsidies. Enterprise can avoid unfair distribution and achieve sustainable growth, understand the scope and use usage of government subsidies, empower companies to manage resource efficiently, enhancing operational efficiency and the public reputation. Through the process of promoting government information disclosure and enterprise earnings management, cooperation and communication between the government and enterprise are essential. A robust information disclosure mechanism should be established, ensuring transparency and timeliness. Policy interpretation and guidance should be provided to enterprise, helping them understand regulation accurately. Enterprise should actively participate in government information disclosure, enhance com communication and protect commercial secrets. Complex co ma management must be reinforced to ensure legal adherence to earnings management practice. In conclusion, government information disclosure and corporate earnings management are inter connected process that reinforce each other. By promoting ethical practice and compliance, enterprise contribute to societal progress and foster corporate relationship between the government and the businesses, ultimately achieving mutual growth. growth. Thanks for your attention. Actually, my work is related to the bio waste material as potential absorbent for non conventional sulfur recovery process of heavy fuel oil. Uh, I am faculty at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan, Canada, and uh, my research area mainly is related to oil, and I am teaching petroleum refinery for graduate students. So my work is related to sulfur. You know the, the problem of sulfur. The problem of sulfur, it's, uh, there are many problems related to corrosion, it's related to the, the quality of the products, related to the pollution. And uh, for this reason, my work is related to this uh, matter and how to reduce the sulfur content from heavy fuel oil. The outline of my work, of my presentation today is, uh, it's my work, it's material, research method, desulfurization process flow diagram, research, result and discussion and conclusion. These are my published papers related to desulfurization process. I have many, many papers related to this, uh, Matter. The material, as I said, uh, that we are using uh, for this work is heavy fuel oil. The amount of uh, sulfur in heavy fuel oil is 1.2%, which is very high and it's not accepted to be used in any country because of the regulation that limits for sulfur content. Also, this fuel oil has high ash content, which is inorganic uh, metals, the asphaltine content, which is aromatics, and the carbon residue, which is again, it's related to the aromatics present in the fuel oil. So we have high ash content, it means high level of heavy metals, high asphaltine content, high carbon residue, and definitely the high sulfur content. So we are trying to improve these properties and mainly reduce the sulfur content. The sulfur content, metal content, we are measured using the energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence technology. 
and the heavy metals uh, you will see it is in uh, ppm which is part per million from the analysis we have high aluminum high cadmium high uh, iron high lead content high zinc content so all these supposed to be improved it means supposed to be reduced after this process we used in this work also commercial oil water demulsifier and the properties of this commercial one. We have the specific gravity, the boil point, the flash point, as well as the color, which is the date palm. We are using the date palm kernel powder as adsorbent material because we are dealing with the adsorption process and also with the extraction process because we are using solvent. So this is solvent or extraction, adsorption, desulfurization process. Why we use this material? Because it's a bio-waste material in this area. So we say that it's good to use this bio-waste material as an effective adsorbent material for sulfur recovery. We use different uh, types, different forms. One is a date palm kernel powder, just we crush, we crush it, we definitely we clean it, we crush it, then we dry it to 105 degrees centigrade to remove any, any contaminant or any water content in this uh, date palm kernel powder and we dry it for 24 hours. Then we uh, sieve it to have a specific particle size because we cannot work with the uh, very high variables of uh, the size. So we try to fix the size at 710 micrometer. Also, we use another form, which is thermally activated date palm kernel powder. We just heat it to 600 degrees centigrade using the muffle furnace for three hours. It closed big porcelain crucible and allowed to cool and then grounded using the porcelain pistol and mortar. This powder, again, we sieve it to have a specific size, which is same as uh, the one we use. It. We will use it or we use it for process for date palm kernel powder. So we are trying to fix some of the variables here. Also, we use chemically activated date palm kernel powder using H2SO4 sulfuric acid activation of the carbonized date palm kernel powder. And uh, the procedure, we show it actually in this research work. And uh, then again, we keep it in closed container. So there will be no effect, effect of any environment on this material. And over time, we are heating at 105 degrees centigrade for one hour, one hour before using in any test. Another form, we activated the date palm kernel powder with the ZNCl2. Of course, we are using again the carbonized one, but before we activate it with H2SO4, now we activate it with ZNCl2. And uh, the method we are following, the method which is uh, available in the literature. And again, uh, we need to heat it 
for at 21.105 degrees centigrade for one hour before we use this material. We use solvent, as I said, we have uh, solvent and adsorb adsorption. So adsorbent, we use the date palm kernel powders and the solvent we are using methyl ethyl ketone and we are using normal heptane and we use also many other uh, solvents. So we mix the heavy fuel oil with the methyl ethyl ketone, normal heptane, without the addition of adsorbent to measure the effect of contact time and solvent to oil ratio on self recovery. This process, we did it in the absence of adsorbent, just to see exactly if there is any change in physical and the amount of sulfur with the solvent oil ratio. So we change the solvent to oil ratio as volume to volume uh, percent. Why? Because actually I want to fix the solvent to oil ratio, then I will fix also the operating time required for this process. So the sulfur recovery was 10% of the original sulfur content using normal heptane and 16.66% using methylated ketone. And the ratio of a three to one solvent to oil ratio was found to be an optimum ratio to achieve the required sulfur recovery. So we fixed the ratio at the three to one solvent to oil ratio. Then we need to understand what is the operating time required to do this process. If we are using definitely different time, it means we cannot compare. So we use different time, different uh, solvent, which is the normal heptane and methylated ketone. We use one hour, two hours, three hours, four and five hours. And uh, we found that that time of two hours was an optimum required time for self recovery because there is no different much change if we go from one from two to three and to four and to five so we said two is enough to do this a process then we mixed the heavy fuel oil with a specific amount of solvent and different amount of adsorbent material for two hours. And uh, then the result, the result we try to analyze for sulfur content, for carbon residue, ash content, asphaltic content, as asphaltine insolubles, viscosity, heat of combustion, flash point, water content, and metal content. The solvent was recovered and analyzed for sulfur recovery. This is because we want to know if we can recycle the solvent or not, because the solvent as you know, it's a flammable material. So we need to take care of it. So we was thinking definitely to reuse it again, if the amount of sulfur is very low. And we found that the amount of sulfur in the recovered solvent is very low, so we can recycle it from this process to reduce the amount of solvent that we need to use in this process because we are thinking to have it as industrial process. This is the process flow diagram for the work, the heavy fuel oil, adsorbent, solvent, go to mixing, then filtration process, the filtrate, uh, from the filtration, go to distillation for sulfur for solvent recovery. Then the oil we are treated to see exactly what is the properties. The solid from filtration is going to extraction process to remove again any solvent uh, to recycle. As I said, we need to find the make up solvent that we are required for this process because this will help us 
to understand how much the net solvent that we need to have. We use different types of solvents using three to one, two hours to see exactly if the solvent, if we change the solvent, we need to know exactly what is the sulfur recovery. Then we found that the MEK and Hiptian has, or they have the highest affinity for sulfur recovery process. The MEKA, the MEK, methylated ketone had the best performance followed by normal heptane, but the two propanol showed no effective on sulfur recovery. And these are the carbon residue, ash content, as felting content and the sulfur content for the fuel oil, for heptane, and for methyl ethyl uh, ketone. This is the extraction absorption process, the effect of the mass of adsorbent on uh, sulfur recovery, all the study using five to 30% sor sorbent material, two hours three to one solvent ratio. So the addition of 15% of, by mass of date popcorn powder has the highest optimum value with 33.3 sulfur recovery. That means we can, remove 33% of the sulfur in heavy fuel oil using the date palm kernel powder. Other form of adsorbent were used for sulfur removal using methylated ketone as solvent. And we found that the zinc chloride carbonized date palm kernel powder has the highest performance for sulfur removal followed by the carbonized time. So these are the percentage of recovery using different types of forms of date palm kernel and also using methylated ketone and heptane. So the zinc oxide has the highest followed by the carbonized followed by the acidic acid and the lowest was the date palm kernel powder without any treatment. These are the carbon residue, ash content, asphaltine content, sulfur for different types of adsorbent material. Again, these are the different uh, solvents that we are using. Then we try to change the temperature from room temperature to elevated temperature. We use 30, 40, and 50 degrees centigrade. And definitely the removal of sulfur will be higher at higher uh, temperature. And we studied also the properties physical properties of the resulting oil at different temperature, which is the carbon residue, asphalting content, ash content, and the sulfur content. As uh, I said that the, the solvent that we recover has very low amount of sulfur, which is lower than 0.015 weight percent, and we, we are able to recover 87 to 92% of the solvent that we are that we were using. The conclusion that we can use this process to reduce the amount of sulfur in heavy fuel oil because of the uh, regulation, limitation of the sulfur. Uh, content in heavy fuel, in marine fuel, uh, because uh, now nowadays we have many restrictions related to the amount of sulfur in these heavy fuels. This is 
we found this is one of the cheapest uh, and easiest method to remove sulfur from these heavy uh, material. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Thank you. Um, um, please share your email address and details in the chat box. Uh, we can stay connected and other participants can also get some knowledge and, and share, uh, you know, get in touch with you. Request you to share details for the chat box, sir. Okay. Thank you. I will go. Ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now I call upon Dalan. Yeah, please share your. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, are you able to see my slides? Yes. Okay. So can I start now? Please go. Ahead. Okay. So hello everyone. Uh, I hope you are hoping having a, a good day. Today I'll present a systematic review for the subject of gender inequality. Um, it is. Um, I think it is very interesting to me, so I hope you like it as well. Uh, so in terms of the gender inequality um, dimensions, there are a lot of, um, like more than one type of gender inequality that we can see, uh, whether in labor market or any different forms of gender inequality. Uh, so this um, systematic review focus on the gender inequality in the labor market. Uh, gender inequality can be related to different dimensions, um, inequality in the uh, enjoyment of rights and legal between males and females, um, cultural discrimination between males and females, um, differentiation between males and females in terms of decision making process, and of course debate uh, employment, uh, pay and social roles, uh, gender inequality in the labor market, which is the um the the form the main focus of this uh, presentation so when we talk about gender inequality uh we need to think about uh, how can we measure uh this gender inequality so we need to think about the measurement of gender inequality and what is um like what's been done until now to measure the gender inequality accurately and also we will talk about the possible explanation for gender inequality in the labor market outcomes. Uh, gender inequality uh, measurement um, Considering the complexity of the problem, most of effort has either involved measuring uh, women's um, social political status, such as education, health, and political rights, or quantifying inequality by constructing uh, composite indices. Uh, several questions have been uh, raised, such as um, what are the most important aspects of inequality that should be measured? Does inequality mean there is an even access to health, uh, education, employment opportunities, paid wages, or uh, empowerment and how should these elements be measured okay <clears throat> several global measurement uh, measures for gender inequality have been created to examine the degree of inequality between males and females in different dimension each of the measurements have a different scope and capture inequality between the two genders by including multiple and a diverse set of variables. Um, for example, the gender development index focus on human development achievement for men and women, gender empowerment index concerns with male and female empowerment, um, gender inequality index 
and the Global Gender Gap Index, which measure the disparity between males and females from different dimensions, as we will talk about them later. Gender Equality Index measures gender equality in different areas and is des designed for uh, European countries. Uh, European Institute for Gender Equality, it was developed mainly for the European countries, Social Institution and Gender Index, the SIGI Index. Okay, um, for most of these indices, including the GGI, GG, GI, GII, and the GDI, and the GEM, is that uh, they do not account for regional differences within a country. For example, the GDI can be high in South India and low in the North, but the index will not take that into consideration and will give the overall average for the country. So without taking into consideration the differences in regions. Furthermore, uh, there is a study believed that uh, the UN uh, DB, measure, uh, DB measurements of gender inequality are not beneficial or informative anymore, and particularly for developed countries. Why? Because these countries have reached very high level of equality, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in education and health. So the uh, studies believe that, the, that there is need for another measures that cover new dimension of gender inequality, such as time, um, based on statistical surveys showing how male and female spend their time, for example. Uh, it's, sorry, it can be seen also that some of, uh, of, of these measures focus on similar aspects, such as empowerment, economic status, and some measures focus only on one aspect, such as the women empowerment, or for example, the social institution, the SIGI index. Some of these measures are more relevant to specific countries, such as those for European countries, and some uh, measures um, address or include variables that represent the level of inequality in these countries. Uh, for example, the GEI cover more advanced areas, such as the sport activities and smoking, um, why, uh, and smoking, while the SIGI index investigates level of inequality in key elements in developing countries. And this is very interesting um, index, the SIGI index, because it covers uh, the informal laws and the social discrimination um, based on gender. Okay, so what are the possible explanations for gender inequality in the labor market outcomes? We will uh, uh, take it from um, uh, the views of economic theories, I would say. So there is based on the human capital theory. According to the human capital theory, human capital acquisition involves cost and benefit. Cost can be direct, and uh, such as education or training tuition fees, or indirect, such as the uh, foregone pay during learning period. Um, or that's, of course, represented by the, the opportunity cost, which referred to as the cost of not pursuing the best, the best uh, alternative. Benefits are related to high potential lifetime earnings and better health outcomes for the individual and other additional intangible benefits for the society, such as less crime, lower unemployment rates in a society. Certainly, as the length of working life increase, gain from the high earnings increase as well, so females uh, who drop out of the labor market either for child be, uh, child caring or housework responsibilities decrease their potential benefit from human capital acquisition, which may result in the reduction in the value of a human capital investment. Uh, based on the labor supply theory, consider, uh, considering labor supply theory, different factors can affect the person's decision to work and how many hours should we work. Uh, these include worker preferences, wage rates, and non-labor income. At the individual level, it is assumed that individuals maximize their well-being uh, by consuming goods and leisure. They face a trade-off between the work and leisure. Those who value leisure time more, uh, they tend to work fewer hours than people who put less value on their leisure. However, preferences are not the only factors uh, that influence labor supply choices or outcomes. There are other observable fa measures, uh, measurable factors such as the wage rate and, um, uh, and those needs to be considered as well. Uh, 
According to the occupational segregation theory, the literature has indicated another explanation for the gender pay gap, which is that uh, of occupational segregation, where employment in occupations are more concentrated by one gender. It has been observed that in UK, for instance, females are prone to be um, overrepresented in the five C's um, occupation of low paying jobs, which are a cleaner, a kit, a caterer, care, cashier, and clerical works. According to re uh, recent statistics at global level, males uh, are underrepresented in health and education field, while females were underrepresented in engineering, constructing, and manufacturing. And that's all showed that there is actually serious occupational segregation. Um, under the labor market discrimination theory, I would say, uh, from the demand side perspective, theories related to the labor market discrimination have provided additional explanation for gender inequality in pay and employment. These include employer discrimination, employee discrimination, and customer discrimination. There are two types of employer discrimination, either taste discrimination, uh, which is related to employer preference or statistical discrimination, which is related to having imperfect or incomplete information regarding potential employees and just anticipating employee behavior in the future based on their uh, gender or race. Uh, the last factor that may explain the inequality in the labor market um, could be based on the culture and social norms. Culture is defined as the social information transmitted via teaching, learning, and imitation, while the word norms, which refer to um, regularity, can have different classifications. First, can we have the legal norms, which is the formal laws uh, and and enforced by the state. Violation of these laws will result in serious punishment from the government. And there is also in contracts, the social norms, which are considered informal and unwritten laws are enforced by the society. Deviation from social expectation could result in social sanction, which are basically uh, forms of shame. Social norms might be expressed as the foundation of culture and the imitation factor works as shared ground between the social norms and culture. Uh, Baker presented a theory linking the reasons behind the traditional division of housework and market work between males and females to specialization gain. As both of, of the males and females have an increasing return resulting from specialization in at least one of the two sectors, this is considered to be uh, very too efficient. Uh, however, this situation leads to gender disparity in pay, as females might opt to work fewer hours in the labor market in order to reconcile, reconcile work and housework duties. Females may opt not to work in the labor market in the first place, so they can uh, do what they are specialized at, as it's claimed. Um, also, other studies illustrate a negative relationship between gender wage gap and male share of housework in developed countries, based on uh, data for the taken from 2007 for 15 advanced countries such as the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, and Denmark. This suggests that as men participate less in household in household work, the gender wage gap tends to be larger. Although the effect was not significant. Uh, their study and the R square was uh, in the model was only 0 0.08, which is very small. Yeah, that's all for my presentation today. Uh, thank you so much for your listening. Do you have any questions? My name is Sagata Shumaska from University of Utah, and I would like to present you a short presentation 
uh, about the topic of my uh, presentation, which is very similar, like previous so social spending and structural population evidence from OECD countries and European Union countries. And what's about the agenda of my presentation? I would like to start with the justification for the choice of a uh, topic, uh, method, and data, which I use results as of the study and summary. So what's about the motivation? It's true that uh, aging is an important uh, process in many advanced economies. And uh, of course, it has many consequences and challenges for policies, not only for the labor market, but also for the policies related to the social um, support uh, to health as, uh, and, and so on. And of course, to the social security system. So what's this, uh, what is the purpose of, of my presentation? So an attempt to determine the economic and sociological determines of the situation of old people in OECD countries, and of course, to recognize the differentiation of the countries. And uh, what's more, I would like to distinguish countries with similar circumstances for uh, old people, and also analyze the assessment of differentiation, uh, which was based on the use of uh, a multivariate statistical methods. So what's about the methods? I start with the sample, which is for OECD uh, countries, and uh, because I have a very uh, big problem with data variability, especially data related to the last uh, period, uh, due to the um, gaps for many countries, uh, I decided to analyze data for 2018 because according to this, uh, I can uh, find more uh, very uh, big set of uh, data uh, available for which will characterize the situation of the old people. But unfortunately, even if I choose this year, I should omit countries like Chile, Costa Rica, Iceland uh, due to the uh, a uh, very big uh, gap in in this kind uh, in data so finally i analyzed uh, 34 out of 37 uh, OECD countries and of course i used the multivariate uh, statistical methods in order to analyze the similarity of the countries with respect to the uh, data which characterize the situation of the old people in the OECD countries. So what's about the variables? Uh, initially, I start with a larger set of uh, variables, but uh, at, uh, at the end, I use only 13 uh, variables uh, due to the collinearity of many variables with uh, the rest and also due to the very low coefficient of variation. So finally, I analyze 13 variables, like for example, gene coefficient, but of course for the people at uh, old age. Also, I use data like, for example, net pension replacement rate uh, for uh, people uh, which are in, um, at uh, uh, old age and also for the one gender male and uh, also, for example, expected years in retirement, old age dependency ratio, uh, also, the source of the pension, which is, for example, from the public transfers from capital, and also because um, due to the problem of uh, high coordination and, of course, a high coefficient of uh, correlation between um, uh, data for uh, women and men, and decided to use only data for one gender for men. And also, if uh, I decided that, for example, this variable is very important to analyze in the context of the situation of the old people, I decided to use the difference between these both variables. Like, for example, variable which is uh, uh, named as a variable number two. Yes, so it's, for example, difference between the effective labor market age and current uh, retirement age. But of course, it's for men. But for example, next variable is difference between the current retirement age for men and women. Yes, so it means in order to uh, show the difference in the situation between both genders, I instead of use the levels, I use the difference. Yes, because uh, it helps me to reduce the problem of uh, correlation between the variables for gender. So this is the correlation matrix in order to show you that uh, I don't have any problem related to the correlation. And uh, finally, before um, uh, ap application of the of the statistical methods, of course, all variables were uh, standardized. But before I standardize the data, I also would like to show you um, a, a development of many indicators, which is related to the 
uh, which are related to the situation of the old people in the context of the OEC data and of course for the 2018 year for example this picture show you the uh, old age dependency ratio and also the public spending on pension as a percent of GDP and we can observe very big differences in these countries that for example Japan or Italy uh, in uh, on the background of the rest of these countries we can observe very high old age dependency ratio yes in the case of uh, Japan in 2018 uh, the core uh, this uh, the, um, uh, variable for all age dependency ratio was nearly 15 percent yes it denotes that each people at age 65 or more was related to one people one person in working ages it's a very a big challenge for the pension system yes and also for the labor market and uh, very low coefficient was for example in Turkey yes and also for example in Mexico yes so it means that uh, uh, in, the, in this kind of countries but for example in the case of Europe and also in, in uh, Italy Japan uh, Portugal um, and also Finland yes we can observe a very high uh, process of aging yes because this ratio was very high and also if we compare this um, uh, indicator with the public spending on pension we can observe that in countries where the old age dependency ratio is quite was quite high also the quite high was uh, public spending on pension yes as a person of GDP. And what's about the development of the uh, eight, eight, old age dependency ratio and also the share of people at age 65 and more in total population? This uh, data for OECD average, we can observe the importance of the aging process, yes, and especially after 2012, we can observe a very high increase. Yes, in in the uh, uh, old age dependency ratio and also in the share uh, of uh, people at age 65 or more in total uh, OECD uh, population. Yes, so the aging is uh, a problem which is growing in importance in the case of the OECD uh, countries. But what's about the uh, income of pensioners? It's also interesting comparison because it shows us the uh, um, situation in the case of the source which uh, are derived from the capital and for public transfer. And of course, in most of OECD countries, uh, most important source of uh, pensioners uh, for pension is, uh, is uh, public transfer. Uh, was public transfer yes but for example in countries like new zealand yes and also canada and also for example korea important was also the uh, capital yes as a source of uh, of uh, pension uh, pension source of uh, income of pensioners so what's about the current and uh, retirement age for women and men in the case of 2018 we can also observe the differences in most of the OECD countries for example very low it was in Turkey yes and also it was a difference between um, uh, um, retirement age for men and women uh, in, for example, generally in most of the uh, OECD countries, uh, it was uh, around 65 years, yes, in the case of uh, women and men, but for example, in few countries it was lower, uh, in uh, a few it was higher, like for example in uh, Israel, Italy, and also for example in Norway, uh, of course in the United States. But uh, also, uh, which is visible, uh, uh, we can observe the difference in most cases between men and women. But for example, in the case of Australia or, for example, in the case of uh, Spain, uh, the, the difference is not so visible. But what's up about the inequalities in the case of people at age 65 and more? So I take into account the Gini, which was uh, calculated for this group of people. We can observe that, for example, uh, take into account the 2018 data and uh, the situation of old people. Uh, the uh, uh, worst situation was in Mexico, yes, due to the, uh, the one of the highest uh, uh, in Gini coefficient. Also, it was in the United States in Korea and for example in Israel very low as for example in Czech Republic in Hungary was also low in Norway and for example in uh, Slovak uh, Republic so it means that uh, generally in the countries uh, which are uh, the new uh, uh, European countries and when we uh, analyze the income inequalities uh, on the background of the net replacement rate we can observe that generally when the net replacement rate uh, 
was high. Yes, also uh, the law was uh, inequality, yes, uh, which was measured by the Gini coefficients. Yes, so generally the higher uh, net pension replacement rate uh, denotes uh, that uh, the uh, level of the inequality in these countries was uh, lower. And what's about the comparison of the net rep pension replacement rate and the uh, old age income poverty? Yes, so it means that it's very similar like the, uh, the, the situation like I show you on the previous slide. We can observe the negative slope. Yes, so it means that uh, the higher is the net pension replacement rate, generally the lower is the old age income poverty. But what is interesting, for example, if we can see on the Cura, yes, which, uh, which for which the uh, old age income in poverty in 2000 2018 was the highest. Yes, so for example, uh, we can observe that uh, in the case of Korea, this uh, level of old age income poverty was uh, achieved uh, at the same level of net pension replacement life, like for example, in the case of New Zealand, yes, or uh, in the case of uh, of um, uh, Switzerland, yes. So it means that uh, it denotes that uh, not only net pension replacement rate is responsible for uh, inequalities, but also other factors, yes. And it is very visible uh, in the case of the example of the uh, Korea. And finally, I would like to show you the public expenditure and pension as a percent of GDP and the old age dependency ratio. We can say that generally uh, the relation uh, taking into account uh, the OECD countries was positive. Yes, so uh, it it's also uh, intuitive. Yes, because when we have a higher old age dependency ratio, probably higher will be the public expenditures on pension. Yes, but of course it depends on the pension system, which is based on the public transfer or which is based, for example, on capital. But generally, uh, the relation uh, the ratio is uh, uh, positive. Yes, this this rela uh, relation. So what's about my study? So let's back. Uh, let's come back to the to the uh, uh, to the beginning. So I analyzed parting variables uh, and I presented before, and I uh, applied them with this variable uh, after standardization into the multivariate uh, statistical methods. And one of them is cluster analysis. When I uh, analyzed uh, my um, uh, this approach, this uh, uh, this method methodology, and when I use this uh, algorithm. Uh, the uh, output of, of this uh, method is the dendrogram, and it is as follows. So according to this, taking into account the methods of cutting off the dendrogram, I uh, finally uh, the, uh, received uh, five clusters. Yes, so it means that five groups of countries uh, which are the most uh, similar taking into account the variables which I used in my uh, method. And what's about the, the, the countries? So, for example, the cluster one is related to the countries uh, uh, which are the European countries, old uh, European countries and more advanced, like, for example, Germany, Finland, Luxembourg, Greece, Italy, Spain, uh, France and Belgium. The second one was related to the countries like, for example, Norway, Netherlands, Denmark, Portugal. Yes, Hungary, Slovenia, Slovak Republic, Czechia, also Poland and Austria. Yes, it means that also European Union countries. Next was related to the countries like Japan, which is interesting, and Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia are Baltic countries, yes, and uh, also similar um, uh, development of the variables was uh, uh, in Japan, yes, and, and these countries. And what's about the Fourth cluster is was, for example, Turkey, yes, also Korea, Mexico, and Israel. And the final cluster number five uh, includes countries like, for example, New Zealand, Canada, Ireland, United Kingdom, Switzerland, Sweden, United States, and Australia. Yes, so taking into account, we can observe that we have two big groups of countries, yes, because uh, the first a group, yes, so it's the, the left uh, group, yes, includes uh, two cl clusters, yes, so uh, generally European Union catch, cl um, countries, and the right one uh, includes uh, three uh, clusters, yes, so uh, it's a mix of countries, yes, because it's, for example, Japan and also Baltic countries, but for example, Korea, Israel, Mexico, yes, New Zealand, United States, and so on, yes. So uh, it is interesting because uh, according to this, I uh, can uh, obtain 
uh, cut uh, clusters which um, take into account, for example, the pension systems are quite similar. And when I analyze the averages for each variables in each country, I can observe that, for example, the um, cluster number one and cluster number four in many cases are, um, uh, are uh, obtain um, um, opposite uh, extremes yes, of, of this variable. For example, in the case of cluster number one, so it means that cluster which includes Luxembourg, Germany, Finland, Greece, uh, Italy, and Belgium, uh, in comparison to the cluster number four, so it means that cluster which includes Korea, Mexico, Israel, and Turkey, we can observe um, um, uh, opposite situation. Like for example, uh, uh, interesting is a variable which uh, name uh, which is um, eight. Yes, so it means that it is the variable uh, which show us uh, variable number eight again income source of old people at age over sixty five and more for public transfers, and and for example ten is old age income poverty. So in case of eight, yes, we can observe that uh, the, uh, the highest uh, value was uh, in case of the cluster one. And, we, and so it means that cluster which, uh, which uh, groups countries uh, from uh, well advanced countries from the European Union. But for example, the lowest value was uh, in countries like uh, Turkey, Mexico, yes, Israel. Yes, so it means that completely opposite situation. The same situation was, for example, in the case of a label which was uh, six and also it was uh, two or five. Two, two it denotes the difference between the actual and uh, a statutory retirement age for a women uh, for men sorry so it means that the lowest was in the case of uh, countries from the European Union but for example in the highest highest was in, in Mexico Israel and so on Turkey and uh, when we compare the situation of uh, men and uh, um, women which was expressed by the variable number three we can observe that also the highest uh, difference was in the case of uh, of uh, a, a cluster which includes countries like mexico israel turkey and also what is interesting when we analyze uh, the situation we can observe that for example the uh, in these countries so it means that the countries included in cluster number four the gini coefficient was highest was the highest. So it means that also the very high was um, uh, uh, where difficult was a uh, situation in the context of the income uh, inequalities. But when I uh, want to uh, compare my results and apply another statistical method in order to uh, distinguish between um, uh, countries and uh, um, and group them into the clusters and ob obtain similar results. So it means that my results can be perceived as a robust, yes, because another uh, method uh, according to which I divided my uh, uh, countries into five clusters give me very similar uh, results, yes, of, of uh, in taking into account grouping countries. But what's about the uh, this uh, this um, picture show us the um uh, averages for each cluster which is related to the uh, variables so when we compare the situation we can see that for example in cluster number uh, three which now is the cluster which groups countries like israel korea mexico new zealand yes in comparison for example to the cluster number uh five so it means that cluster which uh, includes countries like Austria, Czechia, Denmark, Hungary, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Portugal, Slovakia, uh, and Slovenia, we can observe uh, very high differences in the context of, of the uh, clustering method because uh, the uh, variable number one was the variable which show us the uh, inequalities expressed by the Gini coefficient. And for example, in, in countries like uh, Korea, yes, uh, uh, and also Turkey, uh, Mexico, uh, take into account this graph, we can observe that uh, um, the differences uh, or also the inequalities was uh, very high in, in this group of countries, but for example, more advanced countries of the European Union, it was very low. So taking into account this graph, we can compare, yes, the, uh, the average for each variable uh, 
in uh, each cluster. But finally, I wanted to analyze which variable has a very, uh, was the most important input into dividing countries into clusters and analyze this by a specific uh, F-statistic. And according to this, I can observe that the most important for dividing the countries into clusters was for a variable uh, six and variable eight. So it means that for a variable which was expected years in retirement for men, and also in the case of variable which was income source of old people age our 65 uh, or uh, so, it means that in case of the public transport. Very important was also a variable number 10, which was the old age income poverty, variable number 11, which was uh, the public expenditure and pension as a percent of GDP and 13. So it means that effective labor market exit age for women. So I can see uh, I can say that this um, five variables uh, had the most important input into uh, dividing my countries into clusters. But when we can observe that variable three. Uh, according to the probability, has uh, no impact. Yes, had no impact on divided clusters, uh, the countries into cluster, and this variable was variable difference between the current retirement age for men and women. And also we can see this, observe this in the case of this picture, yes, because when we look into the variable free, we can observe that the, the value of this variable was very similar for each uh, cluster, yes, it's uh, without any and a big difference, yes. So very similar was the span between um, uh, between cluster number one, two, three, four, and five. And uh, what some out of, uh, about the summary? So as you can observe, we have very uh, big uh, differences in the case of the European Union. Uh, oh, sorry, OECD countries, and of course the countries were characterized by uh, very high heterogeneity in the context of the situation of the uh, old people. Of course, uh, very important is also the fact that uh, we can divide the countries um, um, of OECD countries between European Union countries, which were especially included in the one big cluster. The, the left one is yes, which included two, which joined two clusters and the uh, rest of the CD countries. Of course, we can observe the regional uh, similarities. And what is also very important, uh, the division between clusters can be joined with the uh, different um, uh, pension systems. Like, for example, we observe that countries like Belgium, Finland, Greece, uh, France, Italy, Luxembourg, or Spain were included in one cluster. But generally, when we take into account the regime of the pension system regime, it was uh, a regime which is named as a corporatist system. And uh, of course, um, we observe that countries with older populations are factors by higher social spending. And of course, uh, in-depth analysis of the performance in the context of three types of pension schemes show a uh, high degree of uh, comparability with the obtained grouping of countries. This is very especially visible in the case of the corporatist system. So thank you for. Uh, so my presentation enhancing resilience in food systems, a comprehensive review of uh, innovative measures. Uh, I will start by uh, uh, introduction followed by a literature review, then discussion and analysis, and I will uh, do a conclusion uh, and policy implication, implication uh, uh, in the final. So food systems are facing challenges such as climate change, pollution, growth, resource uh, and socioeconomic inequalities. It is crucial for these systems to be resilient, adapt to shocks, and ensuring a supply of safe and uh, nutritious uh, food for uh, re for a growing global so this uh, in this context innovative approaches approaches plays a role in enhancing the resilience of food systems by promoting sustainability optimizing resource utilization and improving efficiency in production uh, distribution and consumption the main object of this uh, paper uh, presentation is to explore and analyze, analyze uh, innovative measures that uh, contribute to the resilience of food systems 
So uh, we aim uh, to evaluate uh, their effectiveness, potential twist, scalability, adaptability, as well as their impact on policy and practices. By reviewing and discussing these measures comprehensively, we seek to provide insights into their role in building resilient food system by offering recommendations for future research and actions. So the literature review delves into a, a thorough examination and analysis of many creative approaches to strengthen, strengthening food system resilience. The examination focuses on uh, important issues as a critical foundation in this attempt. Uh, these uh, themes include food source diversification, uh, implementation of sustainable farming techniques, adoption of climate smart uh, agricultural practices, technological innovation exploration, promotion of local food system, uh, food uh, waste reduction, examination of social and economic innovation. Uh, I will start with um, uh, food uh, diversification of food sources which uh, contains uh, several techniques, but I will uh, uh, present uh, just these two ones. Agroforestry systems, uh, which combines the cultivation of uh, three trees and crop in a way that benefits both. The presence of trees help protect uh, against uh, climate-related risks like uh, temperature and wind uh, damage, while also providing shade for crops and acting as a wind breaks. The diverse wood system of trees contributes to soil structure and moisture uh, retention while reduces the impact of uh, drought and uh, ensure uh, enough water uh, for what is for. Um, uh, we have also um, uh, vertical farming, which is a method uh, of producing food that involves uh, growing crops uh, in uh, stacked layers or structures, particularly in uh, urban areas. By utilization space, this approach optimizes land efficiency and for year round cultivation, uh, irrespective of uh, external climate conditions. Uh, various techniques like hydroponics uh, or uh, uh, aeroponics or aquaponics flow to uh, implementing farming. The next techniques are uh, sustainable farming uh, techniques. Uh, we have a regenerative approach that aims to restore and improve ecosystem health while enhancing agricultural productivity. It involves uh, implementing practice, uh, practices that promote soil health, biodiversity, preservation, and carbon sequestrations, uh, all leading to sustainable food system. Uh, organic farming. Uh, system contributes also to the resilience of food system by reducing uh, chemical uh, inputs that can harm ecosystems and human health. They also uh, prioritize uh, soil health, uh, which uh, improves uh, water retention, uh, nutrient uh, uh, availability, and overall crop productivity. Organic practices uh, foster uh, firm uh, sustainability by minimizing soil uh, erosion, uh, conserving uh, water resources, and maintaining the long term uh, viability uh, of agricultural land. Uh, climate smart agriculture uh, by uh, conservation ag agriculture, which is a, 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 an approach that aims to sustainably uh, increase agricultural pro productivity while minimizing the uh, environmental impact. It involves uh, three core uh, principles, soil, soil disturbance, and soil cover, and uh, diversified uh, crop uh, rotation. Uh, these principles contribute to improve the soil health, water conservation, and the climate change uh, adaptation as well. Uh, uh, Agroeco agroecology, uh, which is an uh, ecological approach uh, to agriculture that seeks to optimize the interaction between plants, animals, human, and environment. It emphasizes the, the application of ecological principles to design and manage farming system that is active and environment sustainable. Uh, it includes diversification of uh, the, uh, livestock, uh, integration of uh, trees and uh, agroforestry systems, uh, and uh, the use of uh, natural processes for pest and disease management. Uh, also for technological innovation, we have remote sensing, which is a technology that involves the collection of information about an object or area without direct physical contact. Uh, it uses uh, various uh, sensors such as uh, satellites, uh, aircraft, or drones to capture data on lower uh, vegetation health, soil moisture, and uh, other uh, relevant parameters. 
uh, remote uh, sensing enables uh, for researchers to gather valuable information about uh, their agriculture system, leading to improved decision making and enhanced uh, resilience. Internet of Things uh, devices such as soil moisture sensors, weather uh, stations, and the uh, automated irrigation system enable monitoring of environmental conditions and uh, crops uh, status. This is collect and transmit data, allowing farmers to make informed decision about irrigation, scheduling, fertilization, and the pest by optimizing resource use based on real-time information. Uh, farmers can improve water efficiency, reduce the input uh, costs, and enhance productivity. Local food system and shorter uh, supply chain are also a solution for uh, food resilience. Uh, uh, by referring to urban uh, agriculture, uh, in, um, uh, to the practice of growing and producing food within an urban area, including rooftop garden, city garden, and vegetable farms. Uh, it plays a significant role in promoting local food system for supply chain by reducing the distances, the distance between the production and consumption. It also offers a, a benefit for resilience in food system by enhancing food security. Uh, uh, increasing uh, local food production, reducing dependence on long distance transportation, and providing fresh uh, products to urban communities. For uh, community supported uh, agriculture, uh, it's a model uh, in which consumers uh, form a direct relationship with local farmers by purchasing uh, sh uh, shares or uh, subscriptions in advance. In return, they receive a regular supply of fresh seasonal produce directly from the farm. Uh, it promotes a uh, short supply chain as the food travels uh, a minimal distance from the farm to the consumer, often uh, bypassing uh, intermediaries. Uh, food waste reduction and uh, circular economy. Uh, we have improved st storage and distribution, distribution systems, which is crucial for reducing food waste uh, throughout the supply chain, efficient and well-designed storage facilities such as cold storage can help preserve the quality and extend the uh, shelf life of uh, uh, shareable uh, foods. The, this reduces the likelihood of uh, spoilage before uh, reaching consumers. Uh, innovative uh, food processing technologies uh, offers opportunities for uh, reducing food waste by transforming surplus or imperfect food into valuable products. These technologies can help divert food that uh, would uh, otherwise go to waste uh, and uh, uh, convert uh, convert it into uh, more foods uh, contributing to a circular economy approaches. Uh, one example of innovative food processing technology is the food uh, uh, dehydration, 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 dehydrating uh, plus fruits and uh, vegetables uh, preserves their nutri nutritional value and extend their uh, uh, shelf life. The resulting uh, dried products can be used in various food applications such as uh, snakes, baking ingredients, or burn, reducing waste uh, in value to the food supply chain. So I will pass now to the discussion and analysis uh, system by highlighting the effectiveness of innovative measures in enhancing the resilience of food system. This offers opportunities to address environmental sustainability, resource uh, efficiency, food security, and social equity. However, trade-off challenges uh, and the need uh, for scal scal scalability and adaptability should be considered. Several uh, studies on practical implementation have demonstrated positive outcomes of these innovative measures. For example, agro systems have shown improved soil fertility, enhanced bi biodiversity, and increased resilience to climate uh, variability. Sustainable uh, uh, farming techniques like regenerative, regenerative uh, agriculture and decision farming have demonstrated improvement in soil health, water conservation, and productivity. Technological innovation like remote and the remote sensing and the internet have enabled uh, monitoring and data driven uh, data data driven making, leading to resource optimization and yield uh, improvement. Uh, while innovation uh, uh, 
measures offer significant potential, there are, there are uh, some trade-offs and challenges that need to be considered. For instance, the adoption of new technologies or practices may require, require upfront investment, uh, technical expertise, uh, and supportive infrastructure. Uh, this can uh, pose challenges, particularly for small-scale farmers or resource uh, uh, regions, limiting the widespread adoption of these innovations. There may also be trade-offs between different uh, sustainable goals. For example, while vertical farming and hydroponics uh, offers efficient use of space and resources, they often require energy-intensive artificial uh, uh, lighting and uh, nutrient solutions. Balancing the benefits and drawbacks of these technologies is necessary to ensure overall sustainability. Uh, so to maximize the impact of innovative measures, Stability and adaptability are essential considerations. The ability, the ability to scale up uh, successful initiative, initiatives and adapt them to different contexts and the stakeholders is uh, crucial for widespread adoption and uh, long-term resilience. Uh, scalability can be facilitated through knowledge sharing, capacity building, supportive uh, policy, uh, while effective education channels uh, and networks uh, that connect farmers, uh, researchers, policy makers, uh, and the consumers enable the dissemination of best practices and lessons learned, scaling up successful initiatives uh, that can be achieved through uh, targeted investment and supportive regulation. So for the policy implication, there are several uh, implications uh, for policy supports. Government should develop uh, uh, supportive uh, uh, policies that uh, entail uh, the adoption of innovative measures, provide funding for research uh, and development, and promote sustainable agricultural practices. Uh, for collaboration and partnership, Stakeholders across the food system, including farmers, researchers, policy makers, and consumers, should collaborate and form partnership to share expertise, resource, and best practices. Uh, capacity by uh, uh, programming uh, training sessions and workshops that could be uh, uh, to build capacity of farmers and practitioners in implementing innovative measures. Uh, market access in initiative that promotes fair uh, farmers cooperatives and short supply chain uh, should be supported to ensure equitable uh, market access for small scale farmers and certain uh, uh, local food system. A comparative study of performance evaluation of bipolar plate materials for protein exchange membrane fuel cell. Plan of my presentation. Introduction. Donc, fuel cell, proton exchange membrane fuel cell, bipolar plat candidate material of four bipolar plat, comparative study of candidate material, results and discussion conclusion. Introduction, environmental degradation, the raising cost of fossil fuel and the lending reserve geopolitics and increased global demand of energy have all highlighted the urgent need to find new sources of energy. Hydrogen is a very good candidate for a future of energy. Its storage capacity is three times greater than that of petrol and its use properly uh, controlled present few risk just like that for of na natural gas. For example, the fuel cell element uh, function converter energy chemical to energy electric, element uh, input oxygen and hydrogen, element output each, uh, water and heat. Uh, data and data control. Structure of uh, fuel cell. We have element bipolar plate, 
anode and cathode, gas diffusion layer, catalyst and membrane. And uh, you see the uh, reaction. Use cases, the, the, for, for example, for, for my presentation, I chose dynamic, dynamic uh, use case. Schematic diagram for a vehicle using hydrogen as a fuel. Storage hydrogen, control of uh, hydrogen flow and pressure, and uh, product electrical. For this problem, popular, uh, donc là, we, 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 we chose a uh, popular plant. For a better popular plant, we need three acts for student. This is this perspective. A good product needs three EAs, mat materials, process, and design. Why popular plant? But popular plant presents uh, 50, no, uh, 54, uh, five, 55% white and uh, 37 cost estimation. Uh, desired performance. Desired performance for this popular, uh, popular plot, low density, good mechanical strength, excellent co corrosion uh, resistance, uh, low A, et cetera. This performance is imposed trends in the characteristic of a popular plate between uh, 2017 and, and uh, 2055. Targets set by the user department of energy. Yes, this uh, uh, characteristic. Popular plate material of popular plates. This, this and use we use coated metal, graphite, composite, etc. Candidate material for bipolar play, uh, play, study material. Advantage and disadvantage. Material of bipolar plate, advantage and disadvantage, no metallic and metal. For example, graphite and the composite coating coated material and coated material. Uh, you can uh, see in this in this table uh, the performance con con contradic 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 contradicted. Uh, uh, alors, candidate material for uh, bipolar plate, candidate material, you, uh, you know this characteristic. For example, uh, graphite, electrical conductivity, 100 to uh, 660, for example, and uh, uh, other, 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 other uh, characteristic. For this study, I chose the HB, uh, HB uh, approach, comparative approach, donc la HB comparative, uh, comparative approach to materials. Objective to uh, to implement a material selection process taking account of Department of Energy. Family uh, materials. We have family doc forms, for example, natural material, elastomer, material, uh, metal and alloys, polymer. Yes. Alors, comparative study of candidate uh, principle of material, uh, material sele selected. For example, uh, for, for function support a compressive load, objective minimizing weight, mechanical contrast imposed deformation, geometry contrast thickness, yes, free va, donc variable, this six, section S. Situation of problematic, we have the, the selective model is a bipolar plate and compressive stress. For first study, maximum rigid and uh, minimized mass. Uh, we thank uh, index performance, performance index. 
performance index, we have uh, the order, the element, the, the material, aluminum, graphite, and uh, other material candidate for uh, bipolar blood. Second uh, study maximize compressive strength and minimize mass for second index performance. T titanium alloys, aluminum, silicon epoxy, graphite, stainless steel, the nickel, uh, chromium, nickel, copper. Uh, uh, voilà, for for second, for thirty. Uh, CUD, we have minimize hydrogen embrittlement for uh, performance. Performance index, we have epoxy, graphite, and uh, uh, other material on, uh, in order. 40, uh, don't laugh. For four index, uh, of performance index, we have minimize vibration excitation. Performance index, order, aluminum, epoxy, titanium, nickel, chrome, copper, the nickel, stainless steel, graphite. Is the, the, this index is very important for use case dynamics. Vehicle, for, 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 for example, this, this is very important. Uh, for uh, uh, for uh, performance index, minimize the price. We have aluminum, minimis, uh, the uh, aluminum, stainless, steel, copper, uh, uh, epoxy, graphite. Oh, oh, oh. You see in this in this element we have is titanium alloy is very very uh, expensive uh, than other uh, other materials. L'analyse is a multi contrast analysis. We have a multi contrast analysis. We have uh, index performance A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. I maximize it the index performance. Donc, uh, per, uh, donc là, index performance. A. And this, and this uh, table uh, results is, is, is there. For example, for graphite, we have. Uh, uh, 12.09, for example. Uh, result and discussion. In this uh, study, I, uh, I have uh, uh, materials order. For example, I have their aluminum in uh, first two epoxy, three, for example, stainless steel, uh, uh, Etc. Conclusion in this study, the material select process is complex and uh, only partially due to the variety of materials and process. A choice of material is by nature a multi criteria choice. The design of bipolar plat one looks for a material that is both rigid and strong. In addition, one will uh, require good thermal conductivity, good electrical conductivity, and good corrosion resistance. Some of these criteria are contradictory. It's very important. This, 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 this. The relative importance of the various contrast must be while in a design procedure, the K word is compromised if it's rocky to be both light and inexpensive. It will also be necessary to prioritize the optimization, but we often have to deal with criteria that cannot be quantified or even with criteria that are not explicit. It is this complexity of the different criteria even more than the variety of possible choice then make the selection uh, procedure so uh, dif difficult. Each type of bipolar plate material has 
its advantage and disadvantage, but no single materials meets all the design criteria. The IHB approach was used to select material for the manufacturing for bipolar plate uh, for, for proton exchange membrane for your cell. The choice are uh, therefore possible of dynamics application. Polymer graphite. Polymer graphite composite plot. The objective is to uh, maximize electrical conductivity and fl fl uh, flexural strength. These objectives are conduct, uh, co contradictory. Consequently, a, com a compromise strategy applied. For metallic bipolar plate, the objective is to minimize contact resistance and improve cor uh, corrosion resistance by coating a compromise uh, strategy called the employed due to the contradictory nature of this objective. Thanks for your uh, attention. Thank you.